the Dream Big series uh, steps up as we go into next week, and we talk about how to dream even bigger in serving our neighbors and the nations. We will be expressing generosity throughout the month of November to make all of this happen, and I hope you will be here. We're going to start next week with water baptism. People whose lives have been changed. It's going to be a great time. But today, I have a very important message for us because I want to speak to people who would say, I'd love to dream big, but uh, I can't get over the nightmares. The nightmares of past sin, the nightmares of regret, haunted by those things. And there's no way for you to have the capacity to innovate at the level that the Holy Spirit would like unless you deal with those, unless you deal with that. And I want to tell you today, right from the beginning of this message, that the name, power, and love of Jesus is greater than the darkness that you're dealing with. It really is. I want to talk to people who say, if my life was like a home, uh, I'm living more in a haunted house than a dream home. Like there's more fear than faith. And faith is required to take steps into the future that God has. But there's too much fear. Like considering David, who in Psalm 23, he was in a time of life, it's like a dream home. He's saying, God's everything I need. He's leading me, guiding me, restoring me. I have the tension of battle. I'm, I have a real world, but even while I'm fighting, God is restoring me. God is preparing like a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's spiritual nourishment. Even though he was fighting battles, he was experiencing this joy. This, he said, it's like a cup that's overflowing. That's my heart. That's my life. So aware of the presence of God and the future hope that he says, one day, I'll step right into what is called the house of the Lord, that he would be in a place of eternity with God. But until then, he would be surrounded by the abiding presence. The goodness and the mercy of God would go with him every step of the way. And when you have that kind of awareness of God's presence, you can dream. When you have faith that God is going before you and making a way, providing for you and keeping you strong, you have margin to say, God, what's next? You have hope in the future. You have an excitement about tomorrow. That's a person that's living more in a dream home, but what if it's more like a haunted house? Like David said in Psalm 55, as I read this for you, I want you to know it's the same writer that wrote Psalm 23. It's hard to imagine, but it's true. A Psalm of David Psalm 55, just like Psalm 23, but here he says, listen to, listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I'm distraught. This is the guy who said, the Lord's everything I need. He's guiding, leading, but here he's distraught and he's troubled. Continuing, here's the reason, because of what my enemy's saying because of the threats of the wicked, for they bring down suffering on me, assail me in their anger. Verse four, my heart is in anguish. Notice in verse three, it says suffering was coming down on me, and now you see there's an anguish within him. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen on me. Fear and trembling have beset me. The word beset means continual, like there's no break. Horror has overwhelmed me. It's hard to believe that this is the same writer of Psalm 23, but it is. And I will tell you, there have been times and seasons in my life that were more like Psalm 55 than Psalm 23. If you're there, more like a Psalm 55 season, we're going to pray for you today. We're going to believe God. We're going to believe that as for you, you're going to realign your trust in God and find his hope and his help. Look at a comparison of Psalm 23. This is the dream life. This is the dream home. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He guides me in paths of righteousness. 
He comforts me. That's even when I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. How awesome. Comparing that to Psalm 55, suffering is falling on me, anguish within me, this fear that's continual and besetting me, and horror is overwhelming me. Same writer, just different season. Dream home, a life that is haunted by fear. And unless that's broken, if you're living in a Psalm 55 season, you can't dream because it's more like survival. It's more grinding. Just get me through the day, wondering how I'm even going to make it. So how do you give your mind, your heart, your energy, your attention to a possibility, an opportunity, a big dream? How would you even get into a Psalm 55 season? There are many ways, and I can't cover them all, but a couple that I want to talk about today, I'll set up by saying, think about a gated community. That gate is some level of guard about what comes into your neighborhood. God has given us an eye gate. He's given us an ear gate. And if we don't guard those, then things can have their way with us and move us from the faith that we see in David in Psalm 23, which is faith to believe for what God has for us, to Psalm 55 of just, God help me to make it through the day. In this eye gate, Matthew 6, I think it's so fascinating. Look at it with me. The eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. And when you're in this fullness of the light and life of God, that is where dreaming happens. That's where vision happens becomes clear. That's where the energy to go for it. That's where faith grows. But it would have to be then certainly implied that if our spiritual eyes become unhealthy, then it turns the light off. It turns the light off of those dreams, off of important relationships that are part of that future that God has for you. How does this happen? One way, as John says, that we, we allow lust, the lust of the eyes. We get preoccupied, something on the outside that captivates us and that it begins to turn the light of God out as we get into patterns of sin, even addiction. You may be living with the haunting fear and anguish and depression and discouragement and the root of that might be a sinful pattern in your life. And we need to deal with the root today. We need to get at the foundation. We need to confront that so that you can break free and break through and move on. The Bible talks about eyes of fear. The eye gate and the ear gate, they work together so closely, almost like simultaneously. Moses said to 12 of his leaders, God has a big dream for us as a people, and I want you to go, and you get to see it first. And when you go see it, you come back, and you report to all of us on this promised future that God has. Because Moses knew it was time to possess the inheritance, that which was promised by God. Joshua and Caleb come back and say, it's, it's incredible. There's milk and there's honey, there's grapes. Yes, there are giants and walled cities, but God has given us a promise that we'll be victorious. So let's go and possess the inheritance. But the other 10, they had a different report. They saw the same thing, but instead of having eyes of faith, they had eyes of fear. And this is what it says in the scripture, Numbers chapter 13, verse 33. Those 10 said, we saw Igate, we saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim, that means the giants. Now watch the ear gate, we seemed like grasshoppers. What they saw created this self-talk. That's the narrative that goes on in our mind. That's that conversation that we have with ourselves. That's that voice that seems to never be quiet. And 
if that becomes a negative narrative, it will be destructive to your future. There are some here today, and we need to have a like breakthrough experience with God because you are stuck over what somebody said to and over you perhaps even years ago. And I am not making light of what was said and how embedded it has gotten into your heart. I'm just saying that the power of the name and love and presence of Jesus is stronger. And, and you cannot possess the future that God has for you as long as that kind of conversation gets to feed your mind with all of the destructive implications within that narrative. So they go on and tell their report in chapter 14, verse 1 says, that night all the members of the community raised their voices and they wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt. You remember Egypt, that's where they were held captive by Pharaoh as slaves. That's where they were crying out to God for deliverance. And now they're saying, why is the Lord bringing us into this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go, think of this, go back? Wouldn't it be better to go back to Egypt? See what fear can do? We're not going to stand here and say, I can't believe these people because we're people. And we know what fear can do to us. We know how the negative, destructive, depressing, defeating narrative can feed our mind with similar kind of language. You'll not get through this. You'll not overcome this. This will never work out. You'll never break free. Free. You'll never overcome. You might as well throw in the towel. Why are you even going to church? Why are you going to pray again? You prayed at that. All the stuff that feeds fear until we're not walking in faith, we're not walking in hope. It's just the opposite. And they said to each other, hey, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Now, Joshua and Caleb, it's like they want to grab what Paul will later say in the New Testament. Hey, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard. It's not even entered your mind. All the great things that God has in store. Now, let's go and possess the inheritance that God has for us but they didn't. And that cost them 40 years in a haunted house. The regret, the missed opportunity, four decades in the wilderness. Now Joshua, 40 years later, along with Caleb, they will finally lead those who are left of Israel. Many died in the wilderness, but they will lead the people finally into the promised land. And as those people get there, they will win 20 battles, one right after the other. They will defeat seven barbaric kings, and they will take possession of 10,000 square miles of property. In that property, they'll move into homes they didn't have to build. They'll be enjoying harvest off of crops they did not plant. But think of the people who died in the wilderness. God had a home for them that they never lived in. God had all of this potential. He said, it's a land that flows with milk and honey, meaning I'm going to give you the basics and the blessings. And they never tasted, experienced, or lived in the dream life, the dream home, the promised land because of the strength of fear, the haunting fear. Are you more like Psalm 55, sufferings besetting me and coming on me and anguish is within me and I can't do what God has set before me? Are you Psalm 23? Are you Joshua and Caleb? Be honest with yourself. Have that time of clarity because this is so significant to the life and the future that you will know. And I'm here to say 
that with God, the best days are always in front of you. That with God, there is something in your future that is ordained, that it was foreordained, that even before you were born, God was orchestrating for you to accomplish those works out of the giftings that God has given you. Don't miss it. Who does God want you to meet that will be a catalyst to what God wants you to do? What's the big dream that will take you to a place where you're like, I never even imagined that this was possible, but I expressed faith. I stepped out and look at what God is doing. I don't want to get to heaven and some replay of my life like a highlight reel starts showing and it goes from highlights to things that could have happened. Dr. Oral Roberts shares how in his life he talked about having this vision. It was like a dream and God took him to heaven. And as he's walking through, he went into this warehouse and it was like the warehouse was full of all these miracles. And Dr. Roberts said to Jesus, like, what is all of this? He said, well, this is stuff I wanted to do in your life if you would have just asked me. And he said, coming out of that prayer time, he made a commitment to live in such a way that when he actually got to heaven, that warehouse would be empty. Church, if the gates of hell can't prevail against us, if weapons will be formed, but they cannot, they cannot succeed against us, if we're walking in the spirit and we're not, we're not fighting for victory, but from victory, if we've been given the whole armor of God so that we can be fully equipped with thoughts, with truth, with the word, with strong foundation and footing, then why not step out and believe God at a level beyond anything we ever have? Why not allow your eyes to be full of faith? Why not allow your eyes to let your body, your mind be full of light, vision, purpose, opportunity. Come on. I'm not going to be this person that just sedimentates and lives for the sunset. I'm on my toes. It's time to live for the sunrise. I can't wait for tomorrow. Thank God for the gift of tomorrow. Thank you, God, for the gift of life and gifts and talents and people. Come on, give God a praise that he's a great God, a mighty God, and you can dream big. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I just pray you have a breakthrough in faith. What do you do? What do you really do? And if, if you want to move into a future that's defined by grace, and you know, you know it's going to have challenge, but the challenge will just refine you. How do you get from a Psalm 55 to a Psalm 23? How do you move to a mindset of like Joshua and Caleb? Well, in the Old Testament, at a different place, when the people started experiencing some extreme challenges within their homes, they're like, something's going on here. They couldn't figure it out. They were instructed to call for the priests. The priest would come in. They needed outside help. The priest came in and would examine. And then oftentimes, the priest would say, either you or the people who lived here before you because the priest knew by the streaks in the walls that there are idols that have been built into the walls. And we have a mandate to get the idols out. So there was an examination by the priest, a call to remove anything that was part of darkness. And then the priest would offer sacrifice and apply the blood. What does that mean to you and me? That experience was pointing to Jesus, who Hebrews calls the high priest, the ultimate who just happened to also offer himself as the sacrifice. And by his shed blood at the cross and then his resurrection, we have the incredible blessing of calling out on the name of Jesus. And when we pray in faith in the name of Jesus out of a relationship with Jesus, spiritually, 
there is something that happens like what happened with that priest applying the blood to like the home. There is a standard raise. There is an influence that comes into your life that's greater than darkness and greater than sin and greater than Satan and greater than storms. You start being preoccupied not by that presence that was destroying you and defeating you, but by the presence of life and light. There's been transition. There's been transformation. There has been change by the power of the blood of Jesus. And, and the quickest route to experience the power of who he is is to pray in his name, the name of Jesus. As the worship team joins me, because we're coming to such a great opportunity of experiencing this word, not just hearing it. Well, I'll tell you a story. When I was six years old, in my neighborhood, we were the house next to the last house on the end of the street. So across the street, all these houses, and then at the end of the street, it was a forest, and it wrapped around the houses across from us. And in that day, we loved playing outside. That's all we did. Glad we loved it because that's all there was to do. That's <laughs> what we did. And every day after school, straight outside, and I loved to play in the woods. I loved to climb trees. And there was this one tree that was so awesome. And it was that one. And every day, that was just part of my life. Well, it was this time of year back when I was six, and neighbors had said, we are going to go out into the woods here, and there are trails all through, and we're going to turn it in for Halloween into what's called the haunted forest. And on Halloween, we're going to let those who come down the street be invited into the haunted forest, and they were going to charge like a quarter, and it was a church fundraiser. Worked that out theologically. <laughs> I don't even know why I just said that. Now somebody's going, what? No. I'll blog about that in 2029. Um, so that's what was going on. It was haunted forest. And so I'm told that, you know, ghosts were falling out of trees. And, you know, it's just it, typical. So the next day, I get home from school. And my mamma, normally I would stay at her home. But on occasion, she would come to my house and keep me there before... My parents got home from work, so that day she was at my house. I went outside, went straight to the woods, and when I get to that favorite tree, man, there's still a ghost in that tree, and I'm six years old. I turned and went straight back home. I went in the house, my mom said, what's up? She knew something was wrong, and I said, the forest is still haunted. She said, well, you need to take Jesus into the forest. And my memo, one of the the specific memories I have is how, whether at my home or hers, when she would be walking through the home, she would just be saying the name of Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. She believed that the quickest route to the peace of God was to speak the name of Jesus. She believed that the quickest route to the power of God and like the presence of God needed in a moment was to speak the name of Jesus. She said, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out, I want you to climb that tree and every branch you grab, I want you to just be saying, Jesus, Jesus. And when you get to the ghost, it's nothing more than a bed sheet. You just grab it and throw it down. So I did and I was climbing the tree and I honestly was speaking Jesus because I was not, I was scared. And I didn't know that Memo had kind of followed me and was watching this whole thing. And so when I threw it down, she walked over she goes, that's a really nice sheet. And she picked it up and she folded it. And she said, the ghost just became a gift. She kept the sheet, <laughs> took it home. And I tell you that simple story that is absolutely the way it happened to tell you this because it's true. If you've come in today and there's more fear than faith, the quickest route back to faith is to speak the name of Jesus over that fear. We talk to you a moment about fear. Maybe you even say, I have a spirit of fear, like 
David said in Psalm 55, it never lets up. It never stops. Really want to press into that person who would say, I even struggle sleeping through the night. I wake up with it. I do my day with fear. Well, the Lord has not given you a spirit of fear. And I don't want this to come across as shallow or trite. But I'm just going to tell you, if the Lord didn't give it to you, you don't have to keep it. You don't have to tolerate it. It, it, it has no right or authority. By way of the cross, the high priest has offered himself, and the blood has been shed. And we can apply the blood of Jesus to that spirit of fear by speaking the name of Jesus. And the darkness of fear can be broken. And you can walk out of here today free. Come on, church. In victory. I'm saying to you, the ghost becomes a gift, meaning what used to threaten you is now a testimony of what God can do in somebody's life. Give him a praise if you know what I'm talking about. I want you to think about this. If, if you have just been overwhelmed and it's like something has come down on you, like this is what David said, and because of what's come down on you, now there's an anguish within you. I'm here today to say, how we go from anguish to hope, how we go from anxious thoughts to thoughts of life and possibility is to bring to bear the power of the blood of Jesus by speaking the name of Jesus over that anxiety, over what's coming down. Some of you, it feels like a heavy hand of oppression has come on you. There's a lady in the book of Luke. She was literally physically bent over and the Bible says it was oppression. Jesus saw her that day at church and Jesus called her forward and Jesus prayed over her, called her a daughter and she was delivered and she stood up and, it, and it's like, just imagine this, there was this unseen hand of heaviness and darkness and oppression that it even had a physical impact on her life because we do know emotions affect our body. And she was physically bent over by a spirit of oppression. But when Jesus, watch this, when he placed his hand on her, that hand of darkness had to be lifted. And it says that lady stood up. She was not only healed physically, she was healed from that oppression. And she went about praising God. I'm saying the ghost becomes a gift. Like what has, what had brought her down she left saying, there is a God who is, is greater than the darkness. Who needs that today? Who am I talking to? Who am I talking to? Who am I talking? And you're going, it's me, it's me, it's me, it's me. Because there are many people in the room. It's way more Psalm 55 than Psalm 23. It's way more fear than faith. And I'm fighting for your dreams. I'm fighting for your future today because there is a God who's greater than the darkness. Come on, church, there is a God who's greater than the struggle. There's a God who's greater than the addiction. There's a God who's greater than the pain. Come on, there's a God who's greater than the past. There is a God who's greater than anything. And we get to go before him boldly by just speaking the name of Jesus. Would you stand and put your hands together in honor and praise to Jesus? Come on, everybody. Give him praise. It's going to break some darkness. Break some darkness right now.